was really interested in making a movie told with as few words as possible. Just a very cinematic visual experience, elemental, something very man versus nature. On paper, this is a story about a young woman who wants to be a warrior. And she's facing many oppositions. Why do you want to hunt? Because you all think that I can't. But it's much more than that. I saw a sign in the sky. When I first saw the very first film, I would have never thought that as a Native American Comanche, my culture could ever collide with such a franchise in a film. Cut. Cool. <laughs> One of the things that was so exciting about the original Predator was that it was at the very beginning of the hybridization of genres. It was a horror movie and an action movie. Go. Oh. oh my god. I tracked down a writer I'd always wanted to work with, Patrick Ason, who had the sci-fi chops and the inventiveness paired with period and research. We sort of collaborated pretty intensively together on it. We hired a woman named Juanita Pataponi, who's a Comanche consultant, and she was near tears after reading it because there just hadn't ever been a movie that functioned this way. Not just featuring Native Americans, but having them at the lead of the movie. What are you doing here? Searching for you. Your brother sent us to bring you home. It's a waste of time. I agree. Cut. Every department, there were Native American or First Nation crew members so that we were all making the movie together. Action, guys, what's up? He's down. Stay down. Nada is a young woman in the Comanche camp. She is a fighter. She is strong. Her wants are quite different, I think, than other people would assign to her or imagine for her. Amber Midthunder is amazing. She plays our lead character, who is Naru, and Naru means fight in Comanche. She's great at everything she does, not just the normal day-to-day -day life of a Comanche woman, but as a Comanche woman warrior. Amber is incredibly physically capable and also such a gifted actor in being able to tell a story non-verbally. She can express so much with her eyes. I think she really was able to embody this character in this historical setting that feels immediately relatable to us. All right. That's all right. Well done. Great job. <laughs> Tabe is Naru's younger brother, and they spent their whole lives together in this camp, so they're quite close. Tabe in Comanche means sun, as in the actual sun in the sky, and it also means sun, like a mother's son. You know, there's a lot of expectation on him because he's this tall, young, athletic warrior getting good at what he does. At first, we were very worried about the sibling rivalry dynamic and wanted to make sure that we would love Tabe. And no matter how intense we asked him to get with his sister, it always comes across as there being a care there. There's something else out there. And if there is, I'll get it. I can hunt. You can't. Do I need your permission, War Chief? That is all credit to Dakota's performance. What's really amazing about this film is that we have a lot of First Nations people playing First Nations characters. And that's really important because that's very important to authenticity. <laughs> the tribe is truly a tribe. You see how everybody works together. We spent a month in training camp, all just spending time together, working together, to have that kind of environment and that unified mind. It's what's for breakfast. Very early on, we hired a gentleman named Kevin Starblanket, who is First Nations himself and served in the military and law enforcement. And we enlisted him to train our Comanche warriors. I've been hired as the indigenous trainer. My role is to build a team amongst the stunt doubles as well as the actual crew themselves and the cast along the lines of teaching them how to move, how to use their weapons, how things are done traditionally. You stand here so that you won't have to look up and crane up to see what he sees because he can see further down, right? Yeah. The Comanche were an amazing people. They were called the Lords of the Plains for a reason. They were the best there were at fighting from horseback. So to honor them, we have to be fit. We have to be good with our weapons. 
This morning, uh, I got up early and went out to uh, a ranch out here and been working horses, which is my favorite part of the day. I work with the stick on the horse and I work with the bow on the horse and uh, just kind of getting ready for the movie. It's really enjoyable. So I start most days with a personal trainer, and then I go in and I work with uh, Stephen McMichael as our stunt coordinator, and JJ Park is our fight choreographer. And so we're gonna put together, I think, some fights and just do some drills and get good with our bodies. What? Get up. What? <laughs> get up. I'm a lover of action and was raised by Hong Kong action movies and have been craving my entire life to make an awesome action movie with great fight sequences. Ah! And a part of the secret sauce for me in having a well-designed sequence is being able to see it and holding in wide shots and enjoying the choreography. Like it's gonna be a real strong, you're not, so it's not so upright, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. On the one hand, I wanted to make sure that the action was well articulated, but I also wanted it to feel especially brutal. <laughs> Jeff Cutter is a cinematographer I work with a bunch who is very much a, a huge part of my creative process. If we make this film look like a period drama, but yet its core is still like an exciting action film, that was what really kind of got me going. And the idea of setting the predator in these beautiful environments, forests and streams, and overlooking vistas, and then contrasting that idea of the, the predator, this sort of lethal killer in these beautiful environments, that was a very exciting visual thing that got me very interested. One of the most exciting things for me in the movie, I actually found our composer, Sarah Schachner, through playing video games. We wanted something to feel anthemic and, and epic, and Sarah was able to, to marry those two ideas and, on the one hand, play to the unexpected and embrace more modern sensibilities, and on the other hand, play into the sweeping, character-oriented adventure. And then, of course, figuring out a way to incorporate the original, iconic Alan Silvestri theme, but through Sarah's lens and disguising it in her super intense cellos. Robert Mirabal, who's a renowned Pueblo musician, found a way to craft a sequence with this music and no words, and so it all just felt way more emotional than it was before. Our movie really takes advantage of the variety of land in the, in the Great Plains. So there's so much in the dense woods, but there's also a, a great set piece in an open field of tall grass and up on mesa tops. And one of the first things that happened before production is with the help of the First Nations community in Calgary on Stony Nakoda land, and we had a tribal blessing. We needed to acknowledge the homelands that we were shooting on. And the fact that we were able to have this ceremony for our native people, it just kind of really started us off the right way and in a good way. Prey is set 300 years before the first movie, and it is this creature's first time on Earth. Action! It goes back to the initial Stan Winston design. There's something about the initial design of that guy that I think is just cool. Look, roll. Truly, the Predator is hard to look at at times. The first time that the Predator actually showed up in costume on set, he took everybody by surprise, which the Predator often does, but everybody just applauded because it was just an amazing thing to see him walking out in the middle of the woods. We have to go find whatever left those tracks. I looked over and I like saw him, and this thing happened to me where I was like captured by the sight, and also I really was evaluating if I could kill him for real, and I think I could. <sighs> There's danger nearby. One of the things we wanted to do with the creature in this movie was actually, I really wanted to feel like this was a terrifying, wet, scaly, scary creature. 
Alec Gillis and Tom Woodruff Jr. of ADI, who have worked on every great movie you've ever seen, and all the Alien and Predator movies, did all the creature stuff in this movie. So the way it moves, its facial design, feels like it's not the exact one we've seen. It's got its own identity, and maybe it's from another hemisphere of the same planet, and it's no longer wearing a helmet. Two, one, hit! The Predator still has his code of looking for the strongest threat, but hunts with earlier versions of weapons we had seen before. So he has the laser targeting, but instead of having the plasma cannon that explodes, he's shooting these heat-seeking cross bolts. He has the END, the explosive net device. I love the cut clamp, which is sort of designed off of the old slap bracelets I had when I was a kid that you'd throw around your wrist. The shield was the most exciting thing for me. I love the idea, the way the shield unfolds as a defense mechanism, and then he cleverly uses it in ways for offense as well. That's terribly exciting. Awesome. And I love the idea that this movie could be aspirational as well as intense and suspenseful and terrifying. Having a character that is looked at as a sidekick and having her step up and rise and become the hero, that's something that's incredibly relatable. This is as far as you go, no more. It's really important to me that indigenous youth see themselves in these characters, in these people, that they know that we're here and that we're capable, and that everything that they want to accomplish and everything that they hope to see is accessible and is very, very possible. I'm ready. How are you guys doing? Hey, I just want to thank all the people in here when he said, if, if, if it bleeds, we can kill it. Anybody who applauded, you are my friend. You were my team. I appreciate you. Um, uh, we don't have a, well, actually, we have a good bit of time, but nobody's here to hear me talk. So uh, I want to introduce uh, uh, much of the, the, the crew and a uh, very particular member of the cast of Prey. Uh, first, we have creature designer Alec Gillis. Please come the film's editor, the film's editor, Angela Catanzaro. It's cinematographer Jeff Cutter, producer Jay Myers, lead actress Amber Midthunder, and the film's incredibly talented director Dan Trachtenberg. So Dan, how in the hell did this awesome ass film come to be? I was very inspired by uh, Mad Max Fury Road when it came out, and, and particularly because it was a movie that told a story almost primarily through action. Um, and I love the idea of, of also making something like that, um, but wondered if I could potentially make it not just a visceral experience, but an emotional one as well. So I thought, well, maybe if, it's a, if we take the engine of an underdog story, of a sports movie, and fuse that um, with the action genre, then it maybe would really be a very stirring, rousing, moving experience. And, and thinking of an underdog movie, um, I started thinking about, well, what, what if the protagonist um, was from a culture that is also underrepresented? Um, and, you know, Native American, and particularly Comanche, um, have been very slighted by um, Hollywood and, and, and are often relegated to playing uh, the sidekick or the villain and never really the hero. Um, and I think, I was just thinking about this today, like I, I, I'm actually very um, inspired by video games as much as movies in my formative years, and video games offer a very experiential, um, uh, rather than passive experience that movies are, and I'm always thinking about how can a movie um, feel more experiential, and so there was something about linking um, like you're rooting for a character and you're also rooting for an actor at the same time like the audience gets a very special more experiential time you know at the movies there have been a lot of movies made about uh, the predator I think this one is very distinct and kind of like you kind of got at it right away which was there's a, a cultural dynamic to this film that I think maybe the other films in the series um, either lack or don't address in the way that this film does 
Uh, Jane, you're one of the producers on the film, and you're also uh, a descendant, you're a member of the Comanche Nation. Just talk to me about working uh, with Dan and building the film and making sure that that cultural sort of dynamic, um, the gravitas of it, could play hand in hand with the genre elements of, 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 of a Predator universe. Absolutely, it's about time, I think. So. <laughs> not even a short film, any type of film in our Comanche language. So for us, it just kind of gave us a whole different dimension because as a Comanche, in movies, people see us ride in, we kill everything, we take what we want, we burn everything, and we ride back out. So, you know, they don't see us as a people. But in this film, uh, the way that it's written, you know, it really embraces our culture. And uh, luckily, I got Dan picked me to work on this with him, and so I got to add some of my things, you know, that that happened, you know, when, when I was a, a young woman, but also uh, some cultural things that we had, you know, and then also maybe a little few made up things. But still, <laughs> it's, uh, but it's amazing to just, I mean, see that because our whole Comanche people, you know, were, uh, when they saw it, they were so excited because they said, you, you know, you brought us into reality. This brought us as real people and people now see us that. And so they've always been saying, you know, and uh, now they see us. Amber, what is it like to step into the footsteps of, uh, of Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny Glover, I must say. Danny Glover did a good job. Right, too. But when, you, when you got the script, when you got the call, when you first had your first conversation with Dan, what went through your mind and what did you try to bring to this role? Um, those are all very different things that happened. This did not happen at the same time. I mean, my first conversation with Dan was maybe, was over a year, I think, before I even knew that this was a Predator film. Um, so really all that I knew was kind of this character and I knew that there was a, I knew that there was a movie being made by 20th Studios that was about a young Comanche woman and I was very confused because studios normally don't really want anything to do with native people in, you know, time period movies, so I was very confused about that, a little suspicious. Um, and, but it was really cool and it was a really cool character and I really connected with it right away. Um, and there's this kind of thing that happens to me, I think, with characters where there's like this kind of special, magical um, ingredient that you can't make happen, it just happens. And sometimes I think no matter how much or how little I have a, a script or information about it, um, I call it like the Iron Man suit. It like, it just kind of is something that clicks in and it just fits in a way that I can't describe. And that was kind of the experience that I had with this and then it was the same experience meeting Dan um, we did like a callback over Skype or something and just talked to you. Pre-pandemic, so it was Skype. We were ahead of the curve. <laughs> no Zoom, no Zoom then. Yeah. Um, but you know, I mean, that was just, I think it just felt right, right away. I mean, especially at the test when, you know, when we finally got to meet in person and do this, we did a scene in Comanche. We did, we did all of our scenes in English. We did them in Comanche. And then we had a really cool moment um, where Dan came up to me at the first scene and he was like, listen, I have an idea, and it might be really awful, which immediately, I'm excited by that kind of thing. I'm like, okay, cool, what are we doing? Um, and he was like, it might be weird. If it doesn't work, that's fine. But just, I want you to do the whole scene, but don't do any of the dialogue. But do everything, but don't say a word. And I was like, okay, cool. And I asked a couple questions, and he was like, yeah, yeah. And I was like, okay, cool. And I did it, and he came back, and he didn't say anything, and I didn't say anything, and we just kind of looked at each other, and we both kind of nodded, and I think that was where like our we don't have to talk to each other a lot. We just have like a, I don't think that, yeah, I know. It's okay, cool. And that was where that started. And so for me, it just, everything felt right from the beginning. And then on top of that, the cultural element was like super scary and super exciting. And I just, I think for, for the whole process felt, you know, safe wherever I was going. Even if I was scared, I still felt safe. You know, wh whether that was creatively or culturally or whatever that was. Um, and especially, you know, in a, the undertaking that is this movie, that was really, I think that's like an irreplaceable experience. Um, I want to come to Jeff and, and Angela, the cinematographer and editor uh, on the film. I mean, we're talking now cultural stuff and all this stuff, which is very important. It's why I, I got emotional watching the film this time, I gotta be honest with you. Um, but I want to, but it's also just like, it's a massive film that's also quite intimate. So Jeff, I want to talk about the visual approach uh, to the film, working with Dan and some of the staging and things like that. Um, you know, we were talking about the camera backstage, and then Angela, when you get um, 
what I, what I assume is just a mountain, uh, a mountain of footage. Um, just the approach to slowly building out uh, what became, I think, one of the best films that's been released last year. Just like an awesome fucking film. Yeah, I think for Dan and I, it was, it was really important to kind of present, you know, when we were scouting, and we, we shot a lot of the movie action on First Nations lands, because it was, it's, it's you can see 360, it's beautiful and it's untouched, there's nothing in the way. And really kind of wanted to respect the natural environment and not present it in a sort of slick Hollywood way. Wanted to sort of really feel as real as possible, as beautiful as possible, but also as real as possible, and not feel like we were forcing things and, 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 and artificiality on it. So it was really like trying to find the most beautiful things in the most natural way. And that was sort of, I think, the, the foundation for the photography where we didn't want it to be Anything that would pull pull the audience out, out of the film, and, and where you're not you're thinking like, oh, I'm sensing this that that's a fake Hollywood movie. We want it to be, you know, as real as possible, so that the the intimate stuff would would stand would not to be like dwarfed by the action. So that that way you could because ultimately it's like if you don't care about the characters, and you're not going to care about the film and all the big explosions and all that stuff, which is great. You know, my favorite stuff is some of the action scenes, but. None of that stuff matters if you don't care. So I think that was the sort of foundation for, for what we wanted the film to kind of look like. And then, you know, we just built everything from that and, you know, tried to make it as exciting as possible, but never really trying to make anything stand out for its own sake. Well, and, and Angela, for you, it's interesting hearing Jeff uh, talk about the film that way because as I watch it, especially watching it here with all these people, as a filmmaker, I'm feeling the room, I'm feeling the room. And you guys really take your time at places to sort of progress from one stage to the next, from one set piece to the next. It's almost like, you know, Dan brings Terry Malik in just for a couple of days, you know. <laughs> Terry Malik does his thing, you know, and then Dan comes back. Um, compliment to you, my friend. If you only could hear, with, with previous, what the giant set piece to be saying, but it's gotta be like Malikian, you know? Like, I feel like a jacket saying that word, but, uh, so yeah, well, and, and validating, you know, thank The you. pace to me is, Perfect, just absolutely perfect. What was it like building the thing out, well, Angela? Well, we, we did explore. I mean, Dan, from the moment I met him, I, I think he, it was clear that he's somebody that appreciates editing and the power of, of editing and all of the, the magic that you can do in, in the cutting room and really like exploring all the tools that we had in our quiver, you know, to make this movie um, the best it could be, not just focusing on making the action sequence, you know, action sequences kick ass. It was um, first and foremost about character, because as you said, nobody cares about the action if, you don't, if you're not interested in the character's journey. So um, we really wanted to um, you know, work hard to develop um, Nadu as somebody that we, we understood and wanted to follow her, her journey. Um, I mean, it was there in the script, but we did obviously, you know, do some things editorially um, to to help um, in that in that regard, but um, you know uh, we did have so we had the big action sequences, but then we also did take our time with the more emotional and intimate um, scenes because if you know there are times when I feel that the big action sequences can overwhelm you. It's just a wall of sound. It's frenetic pacing. There's a lot of music. There's a lot of sound design. So when we could be quiet and have those moments with just our characters in the woods, and the woods, you know, the forest is a character in itself, which we find in, in this film, really. Um, those were really important from a pacing standpoint to kind of reset us. Um, and they also did help create tension sometimes, too, uh, those, those quieter moments. Um, but when, like, Nadu is at the river and she's mourning her brother, um, those were really, really special moments. We wanted to take our time. Alec, I want to talk to you about uh, about the creature, about this version of of Predator. He's massive, but he's massive in a different way than I think the. Uh, I'm always thinking of the OG Predator, who was like seven foot eight and shit like that. Uh, just how when Dan came to you and when the project became real, what was your first step in sort of building out with this? I mean, he has the gadgets he has are amazing, amazing. Um, just how, how'd you build this guy out? Dan is a is a is a wonderful collaborator because you know he'll he'll set up parameters for you to work within, and he will he is very much open to options and, and trying different things. But then he'll say certain key phrases like for me in designing this like you know as opposed to the original 
Predator, which I worked on, by the way. I don't know if anybody was aware of that. Uh, There's not a lot of movies we can mention that you couldn't say, yeah, I worked on that, actually, so. <laughs> yeah, no, I, yeah. I'll, I'm, I'm gonna rattle off my entire resume and just give me time. Because um, there were drinks in the green room. Um, but, uh, but, um, Dancing. Talk about how good I was at directing. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. you want to finish? You can finish. <laughs> um, what it, it, everything um, flipped for me when Dan said, "I want this to feel like a horror character," and we had a conversation about it. That the first Predator was so effective because you didn't know what was under that mask, and when it was unveiled, and Arnold says, "You're one ugly motherfucker," right? That was a that was a freak fest, right, at the time. But we've become so familiar with these because we've we've gone down the road with a lot of different, you know, predator movies. Most of which I've also worked on. I won't mention all. Of them. <laughs> um, uh, but um, so the goal was to sort of create the same effect that any uh, that the viewer had when the first movie came out, without being the look of the first movie. And I said to Dan, "Oh, we're going to piss off a lot of fans." And we all kind of just said, well, let's do it. Um, because the idea here is that this, that this predator is, is um, related to other predators. We just sort of feel like the predator world has a ton of diversity, so why don't we explore that? What we wanted to do was to push his technology backwards 300 years so that he wasn't using energy weapons, for instance. He's using actual, um, you know, basically projectiles. arrows, projectile. Um, he's got some of his trademark things, like the three, uh, you know, laser sights, things like that. Uh, but most of his weapons are a little more physical and brutal. And uh, that was a blast to explore all of that stuff. The choreography must have been so impossible to come up with. Um, did, you, did you guys research actual uh, hunting styles, fighting styles of the Comanche, and then how did you blend that with the creature work that Alan did on, 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 on the line? With the choreography, the challenge, especially of her sequence, um, her taking down the uh, the uh, fur trappers, um, was I, I my my other great love is Hong Kong action movies, and I'm I've been dying to make a, a reference Jackie Chan. And the amount so, of Jackie Chan, you <laughs> which is like no one sees that at all. That he you know. sent me. Um, Just so so many. Yeah. Um, and and it was hard, and you know, because there can't be any actual stuff from those movies in her fighting style. So it was like, how do we make it feel like it's legitimate, what she's doing feels right, but it also feel thrilling, and, and she's doing something that's up against impossible odds. Um, so that sequence for me um, was very much about her reaction. So she's always, she's using their weapons against them. She's using their knives. When she needs one, she takes one out of someone and puts it in the other guy, and then she needs it again. We, we had to do it all in one, in, in one shot. There's only way we could get it all. Though we'd never get all the cover photography um, in one day. Uh, but I think we found a way that the camera, for the camera to move the way that Nadu moves. Like, it doesn't feel like uh, a show body one is not like oh look at the crazy things the camera's doing and it's and it's but you're just barely catching the things that she that the camera needs to catch and it also was made in a way that we could hide the cuts because we it was a blend of lots of takes um, and all of that made the sequence I think super special so that when it ends with her catching that tomahawk very challenging to find the way in which she can fight that could be specific to her and this movie um, and and also feel authentic and also be Really? Yeah. Uh, Jane, the, the movie, there's a version of the movie uh, on Hulu that you can play the entire film dubbed in Comanche com from, from start to finish. Tell me about the process of, of building that, if it was the, the actual actress who we see on screen, or if it was. It was. So actually, there wasn't a template for it, but there is now. And I have never uh, worked with dubbing something in, the, in a complete language. And we kind of went back and forth, and we got an approval, you know, towards the end. And they said, you can do this right. And I said, of course I can. Inside, I'm like, ah! So I ran back to Oklahoma, spent a week, and we recorded guide tracks with our Comanche Nation language department, mm -hmm. uh, with the director there, and also with our number one linguist, Guy Narcomi. And we recorded all the tracks, because now all the actors get the choice, rather than having voice actors, you know, 
uh, recreate the roles. So if you watch it in Hulu, on Hulu in Comanche, you're hearing Nadu, you're hearing Tave, you're hearing all the actors recreate their roles, which adds an extra step right into the process. So, um, but it was amazing because uh, Amber's really good with language and everybody was really committed to doing it into the Comanche language. So we recorded guide tracks, came back here, worked with Pixelogic, and uh, put everything into the movie, but what I didn't think of was all the back stuff, like when she's walking through the camp and you see the mother uh, brushing the hair, you see these two men talking, all of that has to be in Comanche too. So everything, everything, you know, even the little, you know, the, the people talking, I'm surprised the dog didn't bark in Comanche. <laughs> but maybe, maybe Saudi did. But, uh, but it's kind of, you know, that, that really set a precedence because when uh, we always pitch films, I pitch plenty of projects in a native language, everybody's like, no, you know, people aren't what we respond to, nobody wants to hear a native language. And our languages are, are dying, but they're on like a kind of a resurgence, you know, of uh, language speakers. So I think that just being able to do it was uh, was amazing, and you know, having everybody recreate their roles because now, like, as a native, like a native kid, when I was growing up, I never had, I never heard anything in my language. I never had people. I always thought Cher was native. I was like, yes, yeah, I want to look like Cher. <laughs> so that was really disappointing. Um, yeah, sorry, but um, <laughs> I was very disappointed. So um, I, uh, but. But now, like, you know, this opens so many conversations, not just for Comanche people, but for language speakers in and uh, inspiring Native children and Native youth. youth uh, Native people are asking their grandparents, kids are asking their grandparents, how do you say this? What do you, you know, what did she mean when she did this? I mean, just all of these things are gestures. Um, you know, it just, it just opened a whole new, whole new world for language. But well, I think one of the cool things is you um, maybe wanted to, to, to dress up as Cher on, on Halloween. I think now... No, every day. They, <laughs> well, after the success of this film and wonderful work that Amber did, I'm sure there are black girls, brown girls, white girls, who next Halloween will be dressing up as, as, as Nora, which is, which is, as Nara, excuse me, which is, which is pretty damn awesome. Amber, representation, it's, um, it's a very loaded word, and typically the first wave of representation is a very serious piece, you know? It's, we have to make this word that honors, you know, our ancestors in the most honorable way. We don't think of genre uh, in that way, and yet somehow the, the six of you here, and I'm sure a whole bunch of people back home, found a way through genre to create one of the most beautiful, and I believe, just like uh, uh, worthwhile, worthy, just wholesome, uh, ways to honor um, uh, our ancestors, your ancestors, uh, the original people who populated this continent. That's a lot of weight to carry on your shoulders, young lady. Uh, how do you feel having uh, having done this film? Uh, this film, and, and what's uh, what do you think of the journey ahead? Um, well, okay. To be honest, when I did find out that this was a Predator film, my immediate reaction was to burst out into tears, <laughs> not of excitement. Purely of anxiety. Um, I actually, my manager, who is here, called me and he was like, I got, this is a Predator movie. And I was shooting something at lunch and I just started crying. And I went to my trailer and I cried all lunch. I didn't eat. Um, <laughs> I was so hungry and I was so scared. But uh, it's true. Um, very brave up there. A little more anxious down here. But I, but no, I mean, because I think I, I, and I didn't really have like a reason. I was really confused at my reaction, to be honest. And I think it was just understanding then, like having all the pieces put together and understanding it and knowing what the possibility could be, that it could be, you know, what truly it has become for representation and for our people, you know, I mean, um, but then also having that, having that at stake, you know, and having that be like, obviously it's a shared responsibility, um, but you know, being an indigenous person telling a story like this, there is, you know, you just, you feel it in a different way. When you have skin in the game, it affects you differently. Um, so I think I felt that all at once, but also, I mean, it, it was exciting and I think it's important to have movies like this that are like genre or that are comedy or the what, whatever else they are besides just, you know, really straight drama historical pieces because one of the most important things about represent, representation is that we are not a monolith, you know, it's like normally, you know, we're, I think, native characters or native stories are often boiled down into being either like hyper spiritual or like really stoic savage and neither of those are correct for us now or even historically um 
And so to have a movie like this where we are afforded not just a look at history in a way that's more accurate, where you get to say, oh look, they had a lot of cool invention. You know, like one of our earliest conversations, and I know a lot of your conversations with Jane were about like, how did how did you brush your hair? How did you brush your teeth? What did, what was the daily life like? And to be able to get to show that in a movie like this is an amazing opportunity. And also to get to have a lot of different personalities where you say like, oh, this person's a little softer. This person has this skill. These relationships are, you know, X, Y, Z, because that's how it's always been. We've always been full people. We are still full people with our own personalities, with our own interests and, and you know, hearts and backgrounds. And to get to show that, not, you know, in history and in present day, I think is an incredible part of the representation of this movie on top of having the first, you know, like indigenous heroine ever, <laughs> um, which has been huge for our people, you know, and, and what we're doing in film also. Normally, I would, yes, please. <laughs> Normally, I would conclude there, but, uh, but I just, I, I have to bring it to you uh, because um, uh, this, this movie wouldn't be possible without you. And there's also a lot of weight on your show, because you mentioned the word possibility. This could have possibly gone a whole lot of different ways. It really could have, and you know what I'm talking about. And we've all seen those films. We've all gone into those films with hope and come out of them with uh, disillusion. <laughs> Did not have an experience with this film. So, man, why did you do this? No, I, I, I'm so, why did you do it as thoughtfully, as carefully? Like, what you could have done, you could have done it so many different ways. And you said earlier, who is a guy who won the best picture like Moonlight? Because look at all the shit you did in here. There's so many details. The simplest one, the movie opens, and there's a bug, and then the rat eats the bug, and then the, the snake eats the rat, and the predator eats the snake. That is just fucking, that is the story of this world 101. Like, why, why did you? But then you also were thoughtful enough to, to, to empower these two women in particular. So she's like, why did you do it, bro? And I'm asking you because there are a lot of young filmmakers in the audience. There are a lot of seasoned filmmakers in the audience. And I think it's great for us to see examples of A, active allyship, which is what I'm, I'm placing that label on you, my friend, and making this film. But also, too, if you don't hear someone explain how and why they did something, maybe it can be hard to see how you can also do it. So I'm sorry to put you on the spot, bro, but why and how did you do this? Uh, well, and, and, and thank you for doing it, let me uh, say. Uh, yeah, thank you for saying kind words. There's probably a million ways to answer this. Um, and they're, they're not as in there's a million reasons why. One was because it would be a great movie. Um, and in that, because we're, you're seeing, I love when I see things that I've never seen before. Um, and I'm constantly chasing um, that exact thing in any genre and anything. Like, well, what doesn't exist yet? Um, and sadly, this hadn't existed yet. So certainly that's one part of the, the thing. The other is um, wanting to make a movie that does good. Like, I, like even, even just, I've had great genre experiences at movies. Some of my favorite movies just exist without any sort of message. But the thing that drives me is when there's a little bit of medicine in the ice cream or um, just making something that I can, I get to walk away with. So even, not just obviously all the representation stuff um, that everyone's spoken to, but also for people that identify more with Amber, um, her, her character, um, than they would, like me, Arnold Schwarzenegger. I, I do not really, Arnold Schwarzenegger is wish fulfillment. Um, Amber is, I relate to that, and, and empowering for anyone who feels like they're up against it and feels like they're capable of more than what people are witnessing. Um, and that leads to like, Pick, having it be the predator as the antagonist, there was a moment when this movie um, didn't, the, the Fox Disney acquisition happened and uh, the movie was maybe not gonna happen, that everyone really loved the script and my reps were like, maybe we should take this somewhere else, maybe it's a great script, like we could just make it a different creature. And I was like, yeah, but the thing that's so rad is that it is the, pre the predator, the thing that goes to a place looking for who is the alpha, and doesn't see her as it. And is this like it, the movie is better because it's that? It's that, um, and the a Predator movie is better because it's this. Like it all just was so much more um, intense. Pot the potential for an intense movie-going experience um, that also can empower 
a whole variety of people. And there were a lot of people that were super skeptical. Um, and the movie really proves that thought that they had wrong, you know? And now they're, they've got a, a hero and a buddy. I have to say something. Yes, if, if there, if I mean, Dan is truly the actual picture of allyship. Like, going through this movie, I was terrified, right, because of all the things I said. And also, like, it, it was not in the hands of an indigenous director. It was not in the hands of an indigenous director or an indigenous writer originally. And that is scary, to be honest. But the thing is, like, when you walk into something with somebody who is not just an incredible artist, but who is also a kind and thoughtful person, and who asks questions, and who gives everybody a voice, and who genuinely wants to learn for the film, but also just out of curiosity and out of life and history, that is the most wonderful thing that you could walk into as a filmmaker, as an actress, as a person of color, whatever it is. And that, like, I mean that with my whole heart, is like truly he is the picture of a good ally. Wow. That's it, that's it. If you are French, you are not happy to be a treasure bird. <laughs> This is the cast of Crew of Prey. Thank you guys very much. Hey everyone, this is Dan Trachtenberg, director of Prey. And some scenes came up in a discussion in the audio commentary track that we wanted to share with everyone on this desk and, and give some more context. So this scene here was at one point the opening of the movie. We actually started on an entirely CG shot following an ant eaten by a fish, grabbed by a hawk, and then the hawk shot out of the sky. And then that was going to be too expensive, and then we actually repurposed that idea to include later on in the movie, in the snake, mouse, predator scene. So this, this was originally our opening. Um, we felt that it was, and it was shot in Comanche. At, at early, early on in the, in the process, we thought the whole movie might be shot in Comanche. And then it became uh, just the opening. And the, so this scene would have played out entirely in Comanche and then transitioned into English uh, when she gets into her teepee. But uh, that all evolved, of course. The other reason why we didn't um, feel this was the best way to open was it was very focused on these other hunters coming through, this Wasape um, and uh, and the other, the other guys um, laying it on a little thick uh, and their their anger towards her. And it was meant to set up that Wasape is the war chief's son, uh, which is a sort of a, cult, a political, cultural dynamic that is not really important to the story. And f we really wanted to make sure that the opening focused on the relationship between Nadu and her brother. Nadu, I think, also in this scene, when we shot it, came off more angsty then ambitious. So we made several changes and ended up with what's in the movie now. Hey everyone, this is Dan Trachtenberg, director of Prey. And this is another scene that we spoke about in the audio commentary and wanted to include on the desk. Originally this scene was tethered to another scene that was cut from the movie where the war chief was talking to his wife about their band needing a new, a new leader, a replacement. And it just felt like it was sort of stamping on the momentum of the movie um, and not ne necessarily the most important information. Um, so this scene, without that, even though we loved it, this little lovely moment between Nadu and this young girl um, just sort of had to go. Uh, the, other, the other thing I loved about this scene was setting up that the bow needs to be clean um, in order to work. If it gets dirt, it'll snap. And uh, of course, that comes into play later in the movie. Hey this, hey, this is Dan Trachtenberg, director of Prey. So this is a, a deleted scene that was meant to occur after Nadu uses Big Beard to bait the predator and before the final fight in the film. And now in the movie, uh, we would cut from the sequence to a little montage of her rigging traps around the uh, mud pit before she lures the predator in. Um, but this was a sequence that we had actually, we did previs for, which is what you're watching. Previs using, you know, initially starting on storyboards and then going to a 3D program. Uh, this was done in Maya. Uh, through the course of this movie, we eventually transitioned to using Unreal, actually, for previs with the awesome team over at Third Floor. 
this sequence was was really cool. We were we were actually b- started building the stages and developing some of the stunt work for this treetop chase. And then we re- we sort of ran out of budget, <laughs> um, ran out of the time and, and money to really put effort into making this what it's meant to be. My favorite moment is this moment right here. This was the only thing that I was sad to lose. I thought this was such a cool little misdirect. Um, but all in all, you know, there was a little voice inside my head saying this was probably going to go. And then and and being able to offer it up to the studio and, and pretending to be sad to lose it in the back of my mind, thinking creatively, you know what? It might not be the best thing for the movie. It, may, it felt well. I love that it showed how agile Nadu was and paid off some of the tree stuff that we had earlier in the movie. I did always wonder if this would have stretched um, credibility a little bit too much and felt a little bit too over the top. But there you have it. <laughs>